We're spending 22 minutes today with the one and only Frankie Valley. Is she here? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I think everyone in the newsroom this morning was singing your song. Oh, great. <laughs> Thrilled to have you here. You're appearing at the Lant Fontaine uh, for a limited engagement. Yes. All your success, all these years in the business, is it th still a thrill to be on stage? Well, it's always a thrill when you're doing something you love to do. Right. So, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to make a living at the thing that I love more than anything else in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a thrill. I would think your concerts turn into sing-alongs. Everybody knows the music. And it's probably a mix of people who were buying your records and new people, too, who know you from Jersey Boys. Well, there are a lot of young people now, you know, uh, who, especially those who've gone to see Jersey Boys. Mm -hmm. Jersey Boys has celebrated its 11th year on Broadway. Unbelievable. Uh, and has been seen more than one time by by most of the people that go to see it. <laughs> There's usually something new each time they come out with it. Uh, but it has, it has been an amazing run. It really has been. Mm -hmm. Closing in January, yeah. is it too soon? Well, remember the old story, everything that goes up comes <laughs> down. It's, uh, uh, I don't think it's closing forever. It's, uh, <laughs> There are places in the world that Jersey Boys is just beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in Sweden, it's in Japan, it's in the UK, and it will be going to South America. Uh, and there are touring companies that will probably continue <coughs> for the next mm -hmm. five or six or seven years, whatever. And just the Broadway run. I understand it was you who pitched the idea for the show originally yes, I did. is that true tell us that, about that well it it was uh, at first uh, we, we had an offer from NBC to do a movie of the week mm -hmm. and then later one from CBS for the same thing and I looked at all the movie of the weeks and I wasn't really that thrilled <laughs> with what I saw and at the time I I said to my partner I said well, maybe it's a play. And there happened to be a guy uh, who, who was a big fan, a promoter, who had a play on Broadway. Victor Victoria was the play. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the guy I'm talking about is John Scheer. So I gave John Scheer a call, and, and we had lunch, and we talked about it. He was very interested. Two weeks later, we signed a, a contract with him. And he had it for three years or four years, which, whichever it was, I don't remember. And nothing was really happening. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get a director and writers together and so forth and so on. And we left John Shear. Uh, we met with Rick Ellis. Rick Ellis and Marshall Brickman pitched it. Mm -hmm to Dodgers. Uh, Des Mackinac was interested in doing it. And I knew that Des ha had experience in Broadway because I'd seen Tommy. And I liked the fact that he, he was not afraid to take chances, mm -hmm. you know, because I did see it that way. And I thought it was an extraordinary story. And we put it together and uh, it was kind of a workshop. It went to La Jolla. It went for six weeks to La Jolla. It stayed about three or four months. And every night was incredible. I, I couldn't believe what was happening, especially since we were not a, a California-based mm -hmm. group. Uh, we were a New York-based uh, group. And I said to my partner, I said, if we get this reaction in New York, we should have a smash play. Mm -hmm. And then, with all that that went down, when we left La Jolla, we couldn't get a theater. There was nothing available. Oh, no. <laughs> for a year. And I thought we blew it totally. I said, that's it, it's not going to happen. Then we did get a theater in it. 
The rest is history. The rest is history. And then, of course, the movie, the Clint Eastwood movie. Did you like the movie? Not particularly. Why not? Uh, the concept wasn't what I felt. I, I thought the movie would be an extension of Jersey Boys and broaden the scope of of the lives of, of the four guys that were in the four seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, I saw the movie more like Goodfellas with four guys who came from a neighborhood uh, that was relatively poor. Newark. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there were all of those kind of characters around. And in those days, most of the clubs that anybody played were, were owned or operated by organized crime. The way the movie so, tells it, they... And the they, movie didn't do that. Yeah. And I also didn't like the fact that the movie was not shot on the East Coast. Okay. See, that was the original idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not, it's not that... Uh, I think Clint Eastwood is a sensational director. But uh, for me, this was more of a Martin Scorsese movie. And That's what it could have been. The, mo the movie does show at the beginning your, your start and that uh, the guys, the, the tough guys in the neighborhood kind of protected you. Yeah, well, it touches on it, mm -hmm. but there was more of that. Right. See, and, and I thought in a movie version it should be an extension beyond what you saw on Broadway. Interesting, interesting. Um, one of the reasons, I guess, in the movie, uh, the guys protected you was that they were aware of your voice, your gift, that famous falsetto. When did you know you could sing like that? Well, I thought everybody could sing. I, you, you know, sometimes if you do things that just happen naturally, you just think, I mean, we all have voices, and I never gave it much thought. And basically... When I was a kid growing up, uh, they had uh, a hit parade, is what they called it, of all the top music that was happening in, in, in a period of time. And uh, you could go into a, a local candy store, a newsstand, and buy a, a songbook. And it had all the lyrics of all the top songs that were happening. And I used to go in and buy these uh, these little pamphlets with the lyrics in, and I liked to sing. So I, I every song that was a hit, I would learn. And basically, the way I learned to sing was by doing impressions and learning more about what the vocal mechanism was really all about and what it could actually do. I mean, if you, went to, if you went to a voice coach, he would teach you how to sing, and if 5,000 other people went, they would all go and they, you would all sing exactly the same. Okay. Now, when you, when you break it down and you look at guys like Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole and Billy Eckstein and Sarah Vaughan and... and and Johnny Ray and, and, and so many other the, of these singers, they all had a style. Right. So if you could take the things that you liked from each person and some of what you were all about, you could develop something that could belong to you so that you sounded like you and nobody else did. Right. So that's basically the way I learned to sing. Never, never a lesson. Never a formal lesson. Well, I, you know, I, I was one time introduced to a guy that was a, a singing teacher at a school in New Jersey. And a, a friend of mine, a musical friend of mine, suggested that I see this guy. And I went in and I saw him and I sang for the guy. And he said to me, he said, why do you want to come to me? 
<laughs> I said, well, I said, so-and-so said that if I went to you, you could, he said, I can't teach you what you do. And I immediately learned that you could develop a, it's like a personality that you have. Uh, we all have a different personality. How does that happen? It's, de it's something that's developed. It's things that we take from the people that are around us and apply them to ourselves that create that personality that you have. Right, right. And you mentioned your musical partner, Bob Gaudio. I know he, yeah. wrote, he, wrote, he wrote songs that were great for you. And I guess the one that really put you guys on the map being Sherry. Right. Now, is it true <coughs> that part of the reason that became a big hit is because a certain radio station, WINS, uh, Murray the K played it? Uh, Murray the K really broke it for mm -hmm. us. Uh, you know, uh, Murray the K used to have a uh, a, a show that uh, he, he played new records mm -hmm. every night, five new records every night. And at the end of the week, they would compete, and we won. <laughs> so we got on the playlist on a regular basis, I think, for two weeks, and and that really helped to break it. Uh, you know the. INS was really big time, you know, with uh, Murray the K and, uh, uh, and, and what's his name before Murray the K? I... I'm sorry, I can't help you. Maybe somebody in the audience <laughs> who knows uh, uh, Alan Free. Alan Free. Okay, okay all there right. We go. <laughs> How could anybody forget Alan Free? Yeah. Those were the guys, those were the innovators. And there were people, there were other people in various parts of the country that, that basically did the same thing. We had a guy in Connecticut who was a friend of Bob Cruz. He was a disc jockey at the big station in Connecticut. His name was Joey Reynolds. And he locked himself in the studio and played the record for about four hours <laughs> and got fired. So, the music business was a different thing. I mean, radio and artists, there was a camaraderie that was so important mm -hmm. that we don't see anymore. It's something that's missing. You would go into a, a, a city, it wouldn't matter what city it was, but there'd be four or five radio stations competing with each other. And you went and saw everybody, and it would take a day or two to cover everything. Mm -hmm. So if you were promoting a record, you could go and you could, you could do that. Today, we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Are there any uh, modern uh, young singers that, whose falsettos or, or just voices that, that you enjoy listening to? The guy that amazes me more than anybody that I've seen in a very, very long time is Bruno Mars. I think that this is an unbelievable talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he killed it on Saturday Night Live the other night. Hey, you night. know, I'm more into the uh, Billy Joel and Elton John and, uh, you know, and, and guys like that uh, are the people that, that I really listen to. The Manhattan Transfer were very, very big. Mm -hmm. Your music, uh, you've had hits before the Beatles, during the Beatles, after the Beatles, in the 70s, December 1963. I think that charted again in, in the 90s. How do you stay current over all the different decades? I, I, think, I, I think you go into record w with a mindset that you're just going into record and not worrying about whether you're having a hit or not. You know, mm -hmm. Do things that you really love to do. Mm -hmm. You can only excel if you love it. So if you're doing a song, you should really like the song that you're doing and the arrangement and the production and so forth and so on. Then you have to hope that there is enough radio left to play the record. You know, how do you have a hit without someone playing it? Right, right. What do you think of the singing competitions? <laughs> you mean the reality yeah. shows? I, I think there's some good and some not too good. You, you know, how do you make a judgment like that? Mm. I see so many incredibly talented people that do these shows. 
that you'd never hear of after they do the show. Uh, we don't have the vehicle that we used to have. Radio was a very important part, and so was uh, so were record companies. There are no record companies. Record stores. Mm -hmm. Where do you buy your records? In a grocery store now? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so how do you have a hit? Yeah. yeah. So I, I wouldn't want to be starting out today. Yeah. And you guys, too, had such wide appeal. We were, we were reminiscing in the newsroom this morning about that great scene in The Deer Hunter where Can't Take My Eyes Off of You comes on the jukebox and these tough guys in their flannel shirts with the book, there's all singing along. <laughs> you guys uh, were not just loved by the screaming girls. Well, I think that we're probably one of the only entities that were able to record, you know, I recorded as Frankie Valley and had hits. Mm -hmm. I recorded as the Four Seasons and had hits. Mm -hmm. uh, we recorded as the Wonder Who and had hits. Uh, we were very broad. And, and most people didn't really realize that we had all those hits and it was all from the same group of people mm -hmm. until the play went on Broadway. And people went and say, oh, I didn't know you did that, and you did this, and you did that. And we, did, we didn't stay in any particular type of music. Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't always small ensembles. Sometimes we would use a big orchestra. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, like I said, uh, success comes out of the love that you put into the things that you do. And if you're doing it for that reason, and you're loving what you're doing, usually people will, will get that message. You'll be able to communicate it. Mm -hmm. You seem to love a little acting, too. You were great in The Sopranos. Hawaii Five-0. Yeah. Anything on the horizon uh, in the TV uh, or movie Well, world? I did Sopranos, and I did Hawaii Five-0, mm -hmm. and I did... Uh, I, I did a cameo in a movie with uh, Michael Douglas and, and uh, Diane Keaton. Uh, when I was coming up as a, uh, as a kid, I always wanted to, I wanted to be an actor also. Mm -hmm. And I very carefully chose very early on as to what what uh, what the major success that I, I would need to have in order to sustain and make a living. I was already working in, in little saloons and clubs, and I could work as often as I wanted. You know, there was plenty of work for me. But acting, you would have to find somebody who liked you, who thought you were right for a part, uh, and you might do a movie or a television show and be fantastic in it and then not get work for 10 years. Right. So the, the consistency that came with singing, I didn't need an agent, I didn't need a manager. Uh, I, I could go and negotiate with the guy who owned the saloon or the club mm -hmm. and, and get a job on my own. And did you really work under that uh, Jersey contract? The handshake? Yes. That, that, that is true. That still exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bob Gordio and I have been partners now for almost 55 years. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. But, you know, that's how it used to be. There were kind of gentler times, I think, through the 60s and 70s and some of the a little piece of the 80s. I, I look at all the confusion that's going on. I, we live in the greatest country in the world and we can't get along with each other because we have different points of view. If it doesn't affect you directly, why are you worried about what this guy is doing or that guy is doing or that gal is doing? I mean, uh, you would think that we would have more appreciation for the freedoms that we have here. If you disagree, all, now we're in parties. We're Democrat and, and Republican and Independents and Green and Red and Blue. And, <laughs> uh, and you have to be careful that you're not 
uh, insulting somebody who's from another party. Uh, you can't even disagree and be friendly. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I, I watch some of what's going on today, and it's 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 frightening. Yeah. But I have a hunch everybody who comes to see you at the Lundfontan, the audience is going to be one big happy family singing along with well, your songs. Well, we try to do that. Yeah. We try to make people come and forget about everything that is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it, it, it's better than going to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, you, you spend the money and you had a great time and you forgot about everything that was going on in your life while you mm -hmm. were there. That's basically what entertaining is. And you get to spend a couple of hours with Frankie Valley. And I'm so lucky to have spent 22 minutes with you. Thank you so very much for coming Thank in. Thank you. It's been pleasure a pleasure to have you here.